Is he on? His, his mic's on up yes. here, you guys. Yes. There we go. Yeah, I thought it was on now. <laughs> Dr. House tells a story that about every platform has a, spe uh, spe a microphone here, here, and here. So the preacher was in, he was there preaching at a big conference, and he said, he got in a big way, and he had a medicine pound it, and he said, I said it to my wife, turn me on! <laughs> it went on. <laughs> he lost the people. He didn't, he didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> I've said a little of this church, that they've given testimony about being saved and going to soul winning, and, and uh, that's what Brother House told us. There's not enough church. This is my favorite church in the market to be. I had teenagers and family in here. I sure want to be here. And saw the teenagers uh, tonight singing. And so, uh, uh, and I'm really impressed, happy to be here. And so don't know any, any other church. He said, Pastor said, one thing about to go about dogs. Now, I love dogs. You hit one of my children, you may get away. If you hit one of my dogs, I'll shoot you. <laughs> I had to give my dogs away when uh, my wife died, and I, I couldn't stay home. You know, I gave them to the lady that took care of her the last, helped me over the last two years, and she only lives about two miles from me, and I can go see them anytime I want to, and take them some ice cream, and, and that but a little dog, I tell you, you don't, you don't have a dog? Yeah, I do. My wife's got one, that's sort of a dog. <laughs> Let me tell you about my dog. His name is Champ Pignese, and it'll be Sean. When I come in tonight, from a from a working 12, 15 hours and that uh, business I have, that garage door go up and, and that when I open that family room door, that little dog, every body, every muscle body just twisting, you know how it is, and run, jump in my arms, and just start kissing me right here in that hot breath, and go up my cheek, and then he stick that hot nose in my ear, and I look at my wife, honey, you treat me like a dog, I come on five times a day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one story. Kind of lights up. <laughs> Trying to figure out what to leave out here tonight. And so, uh, I heard about a man who married his childhood sweetheart. They did everything together. Went to school together, college together, got married. <clears throat> and suddenly she took sick and died. And he thought, what can I put on her tombstone to let everybody know that I loved her? And he had her on her tombstone, my light has gone out. My light has gone out. A few months passed by and he met another lady, started dating her, and they got married. After two or three months, she wanted to go up on the graveyard and see where his first wife was married. And he was afraid to take her up, afraid to be offended her when she saw my light has gone out. So one night she said, I'm going to go up there tomorrow. I've waited long enough. You take me up there. You made an excuse. I'm going to go up there tomorrow. So she went to sleep and he slept up, went up to the graveyard, I got out of bed and wrote something else on that tombstone. And so the next morning he took his wife up and she looked and she started smiling. The sign now that my light has gone out but have struck another match. <laughs> Let's another match. Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel tonight. 1 Samuel. My light has gone out. I put on my wife's tombstone to the prettiest girl Kentucky ever produced and put her picture on it. Isn't that guy? <laughs> now I put two dozen roses in her arms, bird, that bird, to the nicest and prettiest girl I ever dated. I sent her a dozen roses after I've been dating her two weeks. She married me in 90 days. And I, <laughs> and I gave her one rose for every year, 56 years. You all see the big bunch of roses she's bringing in. And when she was sick, about their last birthday, the last anniversary, I took two dozen red roses in, and she was semi-conscious. I said, look what I got you. What I, I said, roses. She said, yeah, they're beautiful. She didn't open my eyes. I put them up here. I said, where would you? I said, smell them. You remember when I got you the first dozen? And she said, yes, and then it was a uh, bunch, but I put, that's why I put the two dozen roses in there to the prettiest girl I ever dated. 
Now in 1 Samuel, I want you to turn to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 9, 1 Samuel chapter 9. And so, <clears throat> I put that joke up, if I ever come back again, I'll take it. <laughs> 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Lachish, whose name was Gish, the son of, I can't pronounce those names, Pastor, I'll go verse 2. <laughs> I used to tell Dr. House, I, now I got to run here while I was an uneducated coal miner with Dr. House, who was one of the smartest men in the world. And I said, I know a lot of two-syllable words. I know it, I know those big, long two-dollar words. I said, you take the word part mints, I own 400. Uh, you take the supply, supply company, dry wall. And I said, part mints. And I said, but I realized me, I'm running for Dr. Howes, who's educated, I better learn a bigger word. One day I got a check, I liked what it said, div, I, den, three syllables. Amen. So, these more than three syllables. But anyway, this man uh, here says he had a son named Paul, uh, Saul, and his animals were lost, and he sent someone to paraphrase it, tell it, and then get on down a little bit. And so he sent Saul and a servant with him to go out looking for the uh, animals. And so it says, then down verse about uh, five, I go down to verse five, nine, five. And when they were come to the land of Zoop, I guess, Saul said to his servant that was with him, come, let us return, lest my father caring for the ashes and, and, and take thought for us. In other words, now we've been gone three days, we can't find them. And he had a servant. I often say this, the best friend you can have is the person who keeps you the closest to God. That's right. Pastor, if I was to join your church, and this church, I say, Pastor, I want to give you, me to give you the name, give me the names of the 10 men that are most loyal to you. Of course, I want to be the friends to the pastor's friend. I don't, if someone's negative, complaining, uh, I don't, I don't, a troublemaker. I don't want to be involved. I've always backed the preachers. I've stayed with Dr. House of thick, uh, thick and thin through wars and everything. And, I, and I, it's too soon, to, I'm not going to turn back now. Right. But I want to know who the people, the 10 best uh, people that you had here. I want to, I want them to be my friends. And it says here, and then if what, I say that before, so I'm going to read the next verse. He said, that's, he said to his servant, we better go back. Daddy's going to look for verse 6. And he said to him, behold, now here's what his servant said. Behold, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man, and all he saith surely comes to pass. Isn't that a wonderful reputation, a reputation now? A man of God. A man of, there's, a, there's in this city a man of God. A man of God. What an honor it is to have a reputation like that. And all he says surely comes to pass. Let us go thither, peradventure, he can show us our way that we should go. Then says Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For our bread is spent and our vessels, and we don't have a present to bring to the man of God. The man of God. Look what he said there. The man of the reputation. And ate in the servant nature of all, and said, Behold, I have here in my hand a fourth part of a shekel of silver that will I give to the man of God. I want you to notice the man of God three times, it says there. And says, then it says uh, here in nine, in the, uh, and, and going down to verse uh, uh, nine, and before times of Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, does he speak, come let us go to the seer? For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then said Saul to his servant, well said, Come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God, the man of God was. There was in this city a man of God. And he said, let's go see him. And when they went to the hill of the city, they found the young maidens going out to draw water. And they said of them, is the seer, or the man of God, is he here? And they answered and, and said, he, he's, behold, he's just in front of you there. Make haste now, for he came today to the city. For there is a sacrifice of the people to the high places, and as soon as you come into the city, you shall straightway find him before he go up to the high places to eat, for the people will not eat until he comes, because he doth bless the sacrifice, and after they eat, that are be bidden. Now therefore, 
uh, get you up for about this time you'd find them and they went up into the city and when they were coming to the city behold Samuel came out against them to go up to that the high place Samuel was a man of God and, and now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before it all came saying tomorrow about this time I will send a man out of this land of Benjamin and thou shalt anoint him to be him captain over my people Israel that he may save my people out of the hands of the Philistines for I looked upon my people because of their cries going to me and when Samuel saw Saul the Lord said unto him behold the man whom I spake to thee uh, this same shall reign over my people and then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said he didn't know who Samuel was, a man of God. He said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered and said, I am the seer. Go up before me into the high place, and you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and will tell thee what is thine heart. As for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not your mind upon them, for they are found, and whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on thy father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjaminite of the smallest of the tribe of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought him them up to a parlor and made them sit in the chief place among them that were bidden, which were about thirty persons. And Samuel said unto the cook, Bring the portions which I gave thee, and uh, which I said unto thee, set it by thee. And the cook took up the shoulder that was, which was upon it, and set it for Saul and Samuel. And behold, that which was left, as he left there in the heat, for in uh, the time I have been kept for thee since, I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. Now look verse 27. As they were going down at the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid thy servant to pass on before us, and he passed on stand a still while, that I may show thee something. Then Samuel took a vial of oil, and poured it upon his head, and kissed him, and said, Is it not because the Lord have anointed thee to be captain over the inheritance? Our Father, we pray your blessings now for the next few minutes. The Holy Spirit of God, speak to our hearts tonight. May each and every one of us who leave here tonight have the desire to have the reputation that these men had, the man of God. The man, there's a man of God in this city. May we all desire that. And then uh, we pray your blessings now upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now in chapter 10, verse 1, Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it over his head and kissed him, and said, It is not because the Lord has anointed thee. And when thou depart from this day, thou shalt find men of Rachel. And then let me skip on down here because of time. Uh, he said, verse 5, he sent Saul on his way, and after that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistine. It shall come to pass when thou come hither to the city, that it meet a company of the prophets coming down the place of Sovereign, and a tabard, my, and, and a pipe and harp before them, and they shall prophesy. Now here's what he said to him. And the Spirit of the Lord shall come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them. Now here's what I like. Thou shalt be turned into another man. Thou shalt be turned into another man. So therefore, if you and I are going to become the son of man, we have to be turned into another man. We the, the God's got to come upon us to be, be to become a, power, a man of God. And now, in ch chapter, the man, the man of God. Now I want you to turn your Bible from there over to Second Kings, Second Kings chapter two. We start, we're going to hear about a, a, a man here was a man of God. And so chapter 2, and so uh, verse 4, 2 Kings chapter 2, and verse 4. Now therefore says the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone. Oh, uh, I better read up a verse for that. I'll start at verse 2. And Hazariah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and was sick and sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Elkhorn, where I will recover or not. But the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, the Tishbite, Arise and go meet the messenger of the king of Samaria and say to him, It is not because there is not a god in Israel that you go up and inquire of Beelzebub. Now therefore, as I said the Lord, thou shalt not come down from the bed on which thou art gone up, and thou shalt die. Now I want you to go from there over to verse 9, I think. And verse 9. Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty, talking about Elijah here. 
And the king sent unto him a captain of fifty men. And he went up by him, and behold, he sat at the top of a hill, and he spake to him, saying, Thou man of God, the king has said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said unto the captain of the fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And I came down from heaven and consumed them and the fifty. And then 11, verse 11 again, he sent him fifty, another captain, fifty men with him. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus had the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto him, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed them with fifty. And then he said, verse 13, he sent him again a captain of, 30, of uh, the third fifty men with his fifty. And the captain of the fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and saying, O oh, oh, man of God, I pray thee, let my life and life of thee fifty, thy servants be grace precious in thy sight. Behold, I came far down from heaven and burnt up the other two captains in the former fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord, a messenger of the Lord, an angel of the Lord said, Elijah, go down unto him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him to the king. And he said to them, for as much as, the, uh, as thou hast sent messengers to the inquire of Beelzebub of God, even Echon, is not that because I am not a God in Israel require of the word of the Lord, thou shalt not come off the bed in which thou hast gone up and surely. So he died according to the Lord, which Elijah said would do. Now in verse two, chapter 2, it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah unto heaven a whirlwind, that Elijah went to Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Turn here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel, and, uh, and Elisha said to him, As the Lord liveth, as I so live, I will not leave thee. And so, so they went down to Bethel, and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came and forth and, and to Elisha and said to him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take him away today? Verse 4, And Elijah said to him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And, and, uh, and he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul live, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets of Jericho came to Elisha and said, Knowest thou not that the Lord will take away thy master today? And so, uh, and he answered, Yes, yes, I know it. Again, now three times or four, Elijah said unto him, Tarry ye here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as I, my soul live, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophet went and stood a view far off. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smoked the water and said, and the water developed hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. It came to pass when they were going over that Elijah said unto Elijah, now listen, Elijah, it's Elijah, ask what I shall give do for thee before I be taken away. And Elijah said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I'm taken away, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they went on and talked that, behold, there appeared, appeared a chariot of fire, of horse fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up in the whirlwind into heaven, and Elijah saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, the horseman thereof, and he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took off also the mantle of Elijah, it fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And, and uh, he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when also smit in the waters, they departed thither. And when the sons of the prophets which saw where the view at Jericho, they saw them, they said, The spirit of Elijah does rest upon Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves down to him. So you see, Elijah, we're passing over now, Elijah, he ran with the man of God, went so far with him, and then when he's taken away, then the mantle fell upon him. That means that you and I, we want to become men of God. We've got to run with men who knows God. And so, which brings me to this. Here, here. It's that I could go on 2 Kings 4 and I could go tell you about Elijah on the Mount Carmel experience. And said, uh, and Elisha here, 
and he becomes uh, uh, the prophet. He replaces uh, Elijah and Elisha. And so uh, in, in chapter 4, verse 9, about Elisha, it says, uh, chapter 4, 9, uh, said, and she said, and her whole now I perceive that this is a man, a holy man of God. I also go back to 4, verse 1. It tells about Elisha here. And uh, in verse chapter 4, verse 1, now I cried that certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest thy servant did, fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take away my two sons to be bondmen. In other words, she had pledged her son. She would borrowed some oil from someone or owed someone a debt and had pledged her sons that didn't pay them back and they come to take it. And so she went to the man of God and said, and then verse, uh, and then, uh, uh, verse 2, and Elisha said to her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thy handmaid have not anything in the house save a, 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 a pot of oil. He said, Go borrow the vessels abroad, all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few, borrow all you can. And then when thou art come in the house, I shut the door upon thee, and thou shalt pour into the vessels, thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass that the vessels were full. She said unto her son, Bring me another vessel. He said unto her, There's no more vessels. And they all stayed. Then she came and told the man of God. Now what do you want to do? He said, Go and sell the oil and pay the debt. And I said, Live. See, the man Elisha hung around Elijah. He wanted the power of God. He wanted to, be a, he wanted to have the title of the man of God. And he became the man of God. Now he's going to prove it a little further. He let how God's going to use the man of God. And so, so there is in this city a man, a holy man of God. It says, verse 8, It fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunan. There was a great woman. I mean, she might have been some means, wealthy. And she constrained him to eat bread. And it was so often as he passed by, he turned in to eat bread. And she said to her husband, Behold, now listen to this. Behold, now I perceive that it's, this is a holy man of God, a holy man of God. Which the pastor by said, let us, we ought to build an addition on the house, make sure, let us make a little chamber, and I pray thee on the wall. Let us set for him a bed and a table, a stool and a candle, and it shall be when he come to us, he shall be uh, turned in thither. And it fell on the day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said unto Gehazi, his servant, Gehazi, call this Shunanite woman and ask her, and call her and sit before him. He said unto him, say unto me, say unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful. In other words, you are interested in taking care of our needs. You have been careful with us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Would thou be spoken of for to the king? In other words, he said, I know the king. I can get you a good job. So the captain of the host, and she answered and said, I dwell with my own people. He said to them, the gaze, what can be done? And Gehazi answered and said, she hath no child, and her husband is old. I think he was 84, no, 85. <laughs> and he came and called her, and when he called her, she stood by the door, and he said, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace the son. And she said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, don't you lie to me. <laughs> and, to the, and the woman conceived and bare a son that season, and Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And so, and when the child was grown, it fell on a day that it went out, and the father was sick, to be, and though the child died, he brought it back to Elisha. I want to paraphrase here because of time. And, he, and so he brought it to Elisha, and when they found Elisha and, and brought Elisha to him, uh, that uh, and Elisha laid on the child and brought it back to life. And so, uh, and so the man of God. But there is in this city a man of God. And so, and so, so I believe with all my soul there is in this city a man of God. I've watched this man, your pastor here for years. He has impeccable reputation. All of I think he's probably one is not the top graduate of Isles Anderson College. I think he's turning out better Christians than anyone else. Why? Because I believe he's a man of God. I believe that God dwells on him. Amen? Amen. 
I believe you got your, your fortune. I was thinking today, you pray for him to live 105. I don't know where you find a replacement like him. You better start training one right now to train your own replacement. But he, he is a man of God. And so his reputation is a man of God. And so, uh, and so since he is a man of God, now let me skip over here for 30 minutes, come over here. Question, I have a question for you. Can a layman be a man of God? Right. Amen. There is in this city, there is in this church a man of God. Now I have a question. Are you a man of God? Amen. Does people have confidence? What are you doing to prove that you're a man of God? Can a layman be the man of God? Now I'm going to read something for you. You don't have to. I'll just turn it over to myself. I think I got it marked here. Uh, First Kings, just yeah, next page. I'm going to tell you where the, what Elisha was what he was doing when Elijah met him. And you don't have to turn there. Uh, he said, 1919, no, wait a minute, no, 1919, I find it. It's all good, just give me some time. I'm 85, <laughs> in four more hours. <laughs> oh, it's verse 19, 19, verse 19. So he departed fence and found Elisha, and uh, Elijah was going through her. And verse 18 says, uh, for, uh, chapter 19, Yet I have left me 7,000 men of Israel. Uh, Israel, all the knees which I bowed down to Baal, and every, every mouth where it kissed. So he departed thence, and when he found Elijah, the son of Shaphat, who was plying with 12 yokes of oxen before him, and, he, and with the 12, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him, and he left the auction and ran to Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. After he said unto him, Go back again. What I have I done to thee? This, may I tell you, what was Elisha before they came? He was a layman. He was a farmer. Right. I think laymen can become men of God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think the Bible's full of examples. I think Nehemiah, who was a layman, I think he's a man of God. I think Joseph might have got a lot of men. Uh, Gideon, Gideon was a layman. Yes, be, be, uh, the layman can become a man of God, a man of God. And he, and he promoted from the farmer, and the disciples came to men of God and followed him. And yes, you can become a man of God. And so, and I said, I qualify to be a man of God myself. I'm trying to be. Amen. I don't. I haven't arrived yet. If I know that much about God, I got a million miles to learn. I haven't arrived, but I'm still trying. I pray all the time. God, what can I do to be a better Christian? Amen. Holy Spirit, teach me how I can please God more. Teach me how I can exalt and magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that all the time. God, cast me not off in time my old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. God, and, and I, I beg him all the time, give me another five more years. You don't pray for me. Pray that God will give me another five more years. And I, but I say I qualify this. I qualify because I, I have the same qualifications as some of the disciples. Listen, Acts 4.13, And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled at them and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Amen. That's good. Now let me paraphrase it. When they saw the boldness of Russell Anderson and perceived that he was unlearned and ignorant man, a coal miner from Kentucky, they marveled at him that he'd been with Jesus. Amen. That's ancient. If you want to become a man of God, you've got to be a, 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 a surrendered man, be a man of God. You've got to surrender to God. You've got to be, I don't know about you, but I'd like to be a man of God. I'd like for people to come to get me uh, to pray. Now, not lest I bra brag on myself, as I let me write, uh, let me tell you what uh, someone said. I, I spoke three weeks ago. Dear Brother Anderson, you have touched our hearts and lives as few, few men have ever done. Now I'm telling you what somebody said about me. God met with us through you. Thank you for being the conduit, the vessel God used to make the difference. You are a true friend, for the Bible says a friend is one who will lay down his life for another thing that you have done thank you for being his friend and our friends signed with the pastor and said then he only he went on another note said help me 
Th uh, thank you, Brother Anderson, for having me in the ways you'll never realize for helping Central Baptist Church and a businessman see, them, see their potential. Thank you for letting, letting uh, the challenge the businessman for allowing God to use you to make the greatest difference in our country. For being a friend of God, thank you very much. The pastor, uh, you have some Commonwealth Baptist college, uh, students here tonight. May I see you really can? Okay. Dr. Fugate said, Brother Anderson, tonight you preached in the tent in Lexington. The power of God was so strong, we dismissed her to go someone, win someone to Christ. We, he was supposed to preach, I preached first, he was supposed to preach next. And the power of God was so prevalent, people was crying at the altar. And he said uh, that we ought to go so in, I think 36 people we won to Christ that night. I was with Dr. Fugate when he led someone to Christ. He said, that was a mountaintop experience in our church. The Lord used you in an unbelievable way to do a work in the, in the hearts of our laymen. Men began to rise early and walk with God. Amen. Remember what I told you this morning? Yep. Met God in the morning. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. And he said, several of my men have challenged to start their own businesses and have done so that successfully. In fact, those times that we had uh, many wonderful things take place in our church. I want to share with some of them. Some of our offerings went from 12,000 to 20,000 per week after I spoke there. And he went on to say another, a lot of other nice things about me. And so I built, I built that college behind the main church. I gave a million dollars that is in the paper. And then yeah, that college down where they are, where you go to college down on the campus now came to sell a million and so over a million dollars. And as bank there told Dr. Fugate they'd loan it to him, the money, and I said, I don't trust that bank. I know that bank came to my town, they get money here and send it to New York. I don't trust them. Always said they're okay. I was in Hawaii two weeks before he was closed. He called me one day, uh, broken hearted. He said the bank just called me and refused to uh, loan us money. I said, You call the title company, ask them whether they take a certified uh, take a personal check from me for me for that the amount, making them some dollars, or do I have to get it certified? He called me back and said, they said they'd take a personal check. <laughs> so I sent a personal check down there. I bought the college. Some businessman, I think, was trying to get that piece of land, beautiful piece of land, across from a horse farm. When I used to speak to this, so I've spoken there a lot. I look across the window upstairs, but not in the new building, though, and I look up and I see those million dollar horses, uh, race horses, or one of those big farms. And then here's one right here in California. The first time I heard you, I was a businessman said this, and some of you may know him, I'll not mention he's in the state of California. The first time I heard you, I was greatly inspired and moved by your testimony of what a businessman can do for the Lord. I have a small owned business, but never used my business for the Lord work other than mission giving. After hearing your testimony about how God used a man with a willing heart to give and seeing the results of your willingness, to get to the job done with no concern of your own prosperity, it greatly changed my heart. I said, because uh, of your this testimony, of your testimony, I have dedicated my business to the Lord and I asked Him to use it for His glory. I'm currently giving 20% of all my equipment profits to Pacific Baptist Church and Christ. Uh, and, and 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 to the Christian school, I also gave fifty thousand dollars. Hey, was there anybody here not want to give fifty thousand? I tell you what, dude, you find a real rich widow. They can make good cornbread. <laughs> and you let me taste it. I was hoping twenty women bring cornbread and let me taste it. <laughs> let me taste it. And she's rich. I'll marry her, providing that she's about ready to hit, but not drop the bucket. <laughs> and then. If I get the her big beat out, I'll give it all to you. <laughs> Tear together. It's bad that I get to be careful. I'd love to get involved. I'm involved in so much now. I've got to come up for half a million dollars a year, Kevin Wynn and Rick Martin. And I've worked since 99. I'm, last year I worked, made two and a half million dollars. But I gave it all and went to preaching. I'm making more money now than I made then. I'm just not getting paid for it. <laughs> and here's what he said 20% of my equipment profits pursuit. I also gave 50000 my church building pro, a banquet campaign. I increased my mission gifts. Our church and God has used to inspire me to get uh, tens of thousands of dollars over my tithe to the Lord. Since I made this decision, my business has prospered and grown greatly. 
You know you reap what you sow. Amen. Huh? Do you know if you'd invested $1,000 in me in 1960 today, you'd been worth approximately $30 million? Only God could do something like that. Amen. And I told you the morning, I didn't pray for God. You, the financial blessings come from God when you do something for Him. Let me tell you something else. You Sunday school teachers, and you bless them. Everybody's involved here, the bus work, everybody's involved here. When you do something for God and you need it, and you know that you did something for God, just like today taught Sunday school, you might have been sick or what, whatever, whatever you do for God. When you pray, you have a right to remind God what you did for Him. That's right. If you tithe, you have a right to remind God. Now, if I was here knowing what I know now, I suppose I was uh, working, making three hundred five hundred dollars a week, seven hundred. One of my children gets sick, and I don't have the money to take them to the doctor. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get on my knees, and I'm going to say, Dear God, we don't have fifty dollars. We tithe this week. Well, we don't have fifty dollars. Take the doctor tomorrow. Now, if in the morning, if this fever of that baby or of our child is not lifted. We will, we will take it, but we're going to trust you tonight. We're going to give you a chance to do it tonight. Now, let me remind you, I tithe Sunday. Read what Nehemiah told God, and I think it's 513. He said, God, I fed 100, and, I think 145 Jews from my table every day. He said, I don't take any salary. He said, the other guy before me took a salary, had to charge a card, Obama cards, and every kind of cards. They had a card, but I, didn't, I did not take advantage. I did not take advantage of poor people and buy their property. Nehemiah was a rich man. That king had paid him well. He said, my table. And then he said this. Now, Lord, you write this down. Don't you forget it. If you go to chapter 13, when the children, when he, uh, Nehemiah left, the layman, went back home, did report to the king for a while. And so he came back. I know I don't tell how many years, but it's been a while because the, the the, they're letting their children marry the heathens. Some of them spoke to half uh, uh, Philistines and half the other. And he said he got them. Listen, you think it's pastor? He got them by the hair of the head. You get rid of that. I'll, I'll strike you around the neck. You want to lose some teeth? He took hold of them. He's not He shook them by the hair of the head. And they made them get rid of those wives. They were not tithing. And the, the priests were out raising a garden. And he got them back to tithing again. And so, and said, now God, every time he did something like, no, God, you write this down. Don't you forget it. Remember that me. And I'm here to tell you that you people, you're working, having this work going. Oh, I'd like to have rewards for some of you. I'm thank God, I, I'd want to be a bus captain down there, not at Michigan, you know, 20 below zero. My, the captains up there got to low zero. It is in college and start their buses. But see, it takes a man of God. Now, if you want to become a man of God, it takes, it's a cost. I won't preach a, a sermon night on the cost of being a good Christian. There's a cost involved if you're going to serve God. There's a cost for this man and his wife to come here and be in a tent for four years or five or something like that. And then look what a compass here. But he's worked, you see, for it. He's a man of God. R.A. Torrey had a pamphlet. I think he preached seven reasons why that God used D.L. Moody. And number one, it says that D.L. Moody was a, a, a surrendered man. And the Bible says in, in Romans 6, 13, neither yield, yourself, ye, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God. And those that are alive from the dead and your members and instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall, and then verse uh, 16, know ye not that to whom you yield yourself, servants, to obey, his servants ye are. And so to whom you obey, for sin unto death or obedience. Who deal? So the best thing we do, if we want to become a man of God, it takes a surrendered man. Neil Moody was a surrendered man. And so uh, a, man, a man of God has got to be a surrendered man. And so I don't know, I'm trying to be. With what, about 1,500 churches? I gave you proof a while ago, Rick Martin and Kevin Wynn, 23, I think 23 million people, something like that, have been saved according to their count, not mine. The money I've sent over there. I'm trying to be, I one in the morning, I'm going to, re, I'm going to rededicate my life in the morning, I'm going to resurrender my life. And to be used, a lot of you here are good people. But someone has said, I think to Dale Moody, it's amazing what can be done with through, that Christ can do through a person who's completely surrendered. 
Now, if we're going to become man of God, the women of God, if we're going to be used of God, we've got to surrender. There has to be a time in my life we surrender. I've several times. I've written God letters. I got someone in 1968 wrote him. I said, God, these financial blessings, I'm just getting started. I, maybe I, I think I was making her then. I said, if these financial blessings are going to stop me from serving you, don't, make, let, don't, don't let me make any more. I want your power. I want to be a better layman. I want to be a, a layman who is known as a man of God. I was down in Alabama speaking, and a woman came to me and said, my mother's sick. And said, well, we watched you for four or five years here, and I believe that you know how to pray. Would you pray for my mother that you'd be better? She's in Kentucky. The next morning, she said, Mama called me this morning and said she's better. And I prayed for some other ladies and some other requests. And it got around that God's answered my prayer. His daughter, the pastor's daughter, Pastor Dumas, his daughter called me and her husband to come to their house and counsel with them. I said, okay, I'll be over. And when I went in and sat down, she said, we're trying to have a family in Cain. I can't conceive. We believe that you can talk to God. Would you pray for us? and ask God to give us a baby. I said, be glad to, providing you promise him. Now, when you want something from God, you tell God what you'll do for him if he does it for you. That's right. Amen. If you'll promise me that you'll have a child in church and Sunday school, if God gives you a baby now, if you, will you promise you'll have it, you'll raise it, you'll be the kind of parents you should be for this child. And some other promises there, she promised would. And I put my hand on their head and prayed, and nine months and seven days later, they hold a beautiful boy in their hand. Amen. I was down there last year, well, I was a five years old little boy, and I was five years old, and I took him out to McDonald's and bought him a Big Mac and a large fry. And so, that run around. They brought another, I was there one night, a little girl, three years old, and no color, no hair, and just said, this baby's done, and we're gonna take it tomorrow for another treatment. Would you pray for it? And I said, yeah, I will. I took it in the room there and we prayed. I was down there about two or three years later and I said, Pastor, what ever happened to that little baby? It looked like it was lifeless. So I prayed for it. I said, see that little red-headed girl over there playing and jump up down five years old? She's all right. Amen. So don't you, do you have any interest in becoming a man of God? Let God use you. Let God use you. I live for one thing, and that's to help. Any poor person in my church don't have to go to head bed hungry. I give money all the time. I guess... Uh, I've given a pastor, I don't know how many pastors I've given a thousand dollars. You write ten people and tell them. By the way, I'll give you a thousand dollars if you give me the ten people. You write and tell them somebody in our church misses you. Somebody's got mad and left the church at this point. Write a letter and say, someone in our church cares for the church and they love you and miss you, but they told me to send you this hundred dollars. One, one pastor, he took some of them up in Michigan. He knocked on this door. And the man came to the door and said, here's a check for $100. There's somebody in our church that loves Jesus and wants you to have the $100. And the man started bawling. He said, Pastor, it's Christmas time. Well, we don't have any groceries. Guess who was in church the next Sunday? Amen. That's what money's for. That money's to help poor people. I have everybody that can. Pastor, I saw the buses, the buses running, little boys and girls. Then Sunday night, I saw a man have an old van, looked like it came over on a boat with Columbus. He loaded those girls and boys up on Sunday night and Wednesday night. They wanted to come back to the church and grow. And I looked at that and I said, God, should I buy, buy them a, a, a 15, 18 passenger Ford van? Yeah, I said, when the pastor, I said, I'm, I'm going to buy the bus kids, the poor kids, a new van, I'm going to buy it for him, providing that no one can use it in the church but this man. He's going to wait a minute, then he's going to take this and run all over the country, these conferences and stuff. It's for the poor people. And so they took me up on it, I went and bought it. I was in church on Wednesday night a few months later, and Grandma so and so died. But Jim Lutz, you know, he's up making an announcement. He said she died and said, uh, with a barrel to be sewing, and these four girls got up, just they broke out loud, crying, and left the church. I called pa, uh, Brother Lutz the next day. I said, pa, Brother Lutz, what happened? I didn't put no chair. Well, I said, their dad and mother got on drugs, and they lost their children, and Grandma and Grandpa, Grandpa has been raising them. Grandpa died about two years ago. I preached his funeral, but 12, 15 people saved. Now, Grandma has died, has died, and now the girls is broken hearted. They don't know where they're going to live. And they looked, uh, I don't know how to tell you this dress like street people. They had no clothes, dirty. I said, Brother Lux, 
I'm going to, I ask you to do something for me. I'm going to give you and Vicky money. You take those girls out shopping, buy them some new outfits. That funeral's coming up. And I said, here's the money. I said, I'll pay you all $100 a day too. And I just take them out and gave him that. He called me back about 2 o'clock next day. He said, Brother Anderson, these girls didn't even have any underclothes. They don't have any sizes. It's going to take longer. It's going to cost more. I said, I, the sky's the limit. I said, dress them up. And so he didn't get done the first day, and they went back the second day. Oh, I told him the first day. I said, at 1 o'clock, those girls are probably hungry. I said, you take them out. They'd never been to a Burger King. They saw that picture there of that big giant milkshake. Said, we have one of that? Yeah, can we have a whole one? Yeah, they got it. Can we have double fries, a big fry? Can we have a big double hamburger? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'd never had it before. And I had the privilege of buying them their first milkshake. I had the privilege of buying them their first french fries. And I, I feed them. And so the next day he took them back and, uh, and, and finished shopping again. And when they walked in, I've mean, never seen that. Uh, my fair lady, you ever seen that movie? They don't cuss and no lewdness in that. You remember that the girl they talked to her and talked, she had that, went to race, had that big fine hat on. You know, she walked out and all oh, they was looking at her. That's why those girls walked in on Sunday with that funeral. And I saw those clothes, new shoes, new underclothes, new skirts and that. And people's eyes just went like this on. Thank God, I got to do that. I got to do that. And then some, some relative took them about 60 miles from them. And I told the brother the other day, I said, you go back and check on them girls there and buy them another milkshake. Buy them some more french fries if you have to. But I said, I want to take care of them. That's, that's why they, see, to be a man of God. Does that make you be a man of God? I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be. But to be a man of God, you need to be a surrendered. A surrendered man. I tell you, take surrender. Less Friday nights. Six or seven Friday weeks on Friday nights, all night long, fly that airplane from Honolulu to Atlanta, about nine hours, get there at seven o'clock in the morning, catch another flight, and go to New Jersey, North Carolina, Georgia, other places, all over the place. It takes a surrender man to do that, and I'm so glad. But everything we do for God, He's going to reward us someday. Amen. Now, tell me. You've got a man of God. You see, a man of God produces men of God. There's many of them. You're doing God's work, but there's one other step you need to do. You need to surrender. If you've never done it, God, I'm going to surrender my life. You take it. It's going to be number one. I, had to do, I, had to, I walked away from seven businesses. I walked away from 457 houses and apartments paid for, a bunch of condos in Waikiki Beach. And so I walked away from all that. I said, God, you can have it all. Yes, there's a price to pay, but hey, look at the price Jesus paid for you and I. Amen. When you want to be a, a man of God. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, if there is in this city a man of God. Is there any man of God in this church that really wants to be their life to count? How many more men? God, you love every man in here just as much as you love me. How many more men could be done so much more if they would just surrender their life and get really get behind and help this church to grow and keep giving? What a great testimony it would be. Man of God, we need men of God. Men of God. Let's all stand with our heads bowed. If God's talking to you, men, I want you to come to this con right here. Pastor, would you go down and shake your hand? Tell Pastor, say, I, I want to become, I want to get behind you in this work. I want to become more of a man of God. Start playing just as I am anything. Oh, gee, that's it. Come on now. Come on now, men and women of God. Come on now, hit the altar here now. God spoke to you tonight. You want to become a man of God? It takes surrender. Come and surrender to God. That's what I did. I walked away from a multi million dollar business. There's a cost. Oh, yes, yes. Why don't you come and be a man of God? You ladies can come and too. God uses ladies too. God help me to be a better Sunday school teacher. Help me be a better wife. God, help me to be a better husband. Help me to be a better soul winner. God, now God's leading here tonight. Please don't go home if God's speaking to you. Right down here, Lord Victor. Surrender your life tonight to God. Surrender your life to God. Now, right where you have some men's dealing right at the altar, right at the pew where that spent surrender to God. That's what it takes. It's amazing what can be done with someone who's totally surrendered to God.
about 8 1,500 churches, 10 Bible colleges. That's what God did after I surrendered to him. Gave him the business. There's a cost. There's a cost. There's a price to pay to follow Christ from day to day. To reach the loss and count the cost. That's why I say, why don't you come? Who else will come? Pastor, will you come? If you're not sure you're saved tonight, would you come forward? A lot of folks just praying. Don't hurry at the altar. Take time to pray. We're going to baptize in just a moment. If you're not sure you're saved, please come now. If you've been saved never baptized, now would be a good time to do that. Brother Chris, if you'll work your way up here, we could use you to lead a chorus while I go change. And we've got a wonderful God, a faithful God. Um, no one ever looks back at life wishing that they had given God less. Always that they had given Him more. Always. One glimpse of His dear face all sorrow will erase but also by and by when I look on His face I wish I'd given Him more. Brother Gron's going to lead us in a song or two just real quick. Be seated. Let me baptize and if you're